Great. Great. All so, right. All right. So, Wu. thank you so much for the kind introduction. And thank you, Tara, for the ongoing and forever support. So um, let me just point out that Chinwu is not only a Terra community leader, he's also a vineyard consultant and an earth data scientist. And much of what you'll see later in our talk actually has Chinwu's contributions all over it. So today, what we'd like to show you is a climate solutions recommender. Using the climate pie, you can select a location, pie diagnoses location-based problems and recommends a list of solutions to address those problems with the predicted impact on local people and climate. So as most of you know, the world already has all the solutions we need to address climate change. The only thing left is to scale them. So we want to help provide these insights as to what needs to go where so that investments can start to flow faster with the confidence of knowing their predictable results. Machine learning will allow us to uncover the reasons and the factors present in a location to ensure either success or failure of deployment. So the open data structure is going to enable us to encourage collaboration from all of the places these solutions are already being tested. So I'm very happy that from our founding team, uh, many people today, we have Adam Marks, who is our project manager, analyst, data engineer, as well as another Terra alum. And Leanne, of course, you just met, who is an environmental scientist, turned business development and partnerships manager for us. Tom Keane, a uh, climate scientist, he's with us today. Jackie Forte, who is operations. Alex Bertuzzi, one of our advising engineers. And unfortunately, our UK-based uh, CTO, Tony, Tony Kenyon, wasn't able to join us, but we'll do our best to manage any technical questions you might have. So we all agreed in 2015 on net zero by 2050, and we realized that we need to get everything in motion by 2030, otherwise we're never going to get there. And we all know what the big problem is. We actually have all the emission sources data, and we're about to get all of the emission source location data with the global stock taking that's happening this year in the run-up to COP28. That's going to be incredibly interesting. It's Climate Trace who's going to conduct that, and it's going to be compared to each of the country's NDCs. Here's what I promised. Here's what I did. Where's the delta? We know that this is not going to be perfect. It's the very beginning of the real carbon accounting system. So it's going to be incredibly interesting to watch. So we know the majority of emissions come from fossil fuels. We know that it all comes from various sectors of our global economy, energy, materials, land use, powering stuff, making stuff, getting around, eating stuff. That's us. That's our life. And we're all a part of it. No need to point fingers. Fossil fuels are the source of our growth. Now we need to replace that source and adapt our habits accordingly. It's really that simple. So we know what the big problem is and where we need to take care of it, but we have all the solutions that we need. And thank goodness for Project Drawdown. This was actually the genesis of the pie. It was uh, one of Paul Hawkins' earlier speeches uh, before the book came out. And he said, so if we know what all the problems are, has anybody made a list of all the solutions? Silence. No, nobody had ever done that. So we set about gathering all these scientific minds to put together what looked like PhD theses on each of these solutions and rank them according to one to 100. What is the what are the highest impact solutions at global scale? So remember this global scale. And if you haven't ever bought the book, you must do so. So we know on the top of the 100 solutions as expected is food waste, number three, methane emissions from landfills, rotting crops. We throw away 30% of all the food that's produced and plant-based diets, obviously, many reasons for that, but it's number four. But if we ate fewer animals, we'd have much less than 77% of our land degraded and we understand why this is a problem. But we're seeing more and more solutions beyond that 100 list coming online. So if you haven't seen it, Solar Impulse Foundation is really interesting. They've gone out and certified over 1,000 solutions that are both economically and environmentally viable. And they've created a really great searchable database by sector or country. And 
the World Resources Institute, over 1,400 proofs of concepts of solutions being tested on the ground and impact data gathered, and the wonderful Earthshot Prize. And they're, they celebrate five, each one gets a million pounds, but then they have 15 runners up and each one is more interesting than the last. And interestingly, many are skeptical that we'll manage to the really hard to abate sectors, but actually these solutions are already here as well. Sustainable aviation fuel in production by 2025, heavy trucks available as electric two years ago, green ammonia to power shipping industry available next year, commercial scale zero emission cement plants opening up this year. So this slide is a little busy, but essentially, if we scaled all the solutions that we have available today, we could not only meet the 50% reductions by 2030, we could surpass it. We could see 70% reductions from all these sectors. So these two last slides are adapted graphics from a fantastic report that I encourage all of you to read. It's the Paris effect from Systemic. And it's essentially, how are we doing so far since Paris? And I think you'll find we're doing much better than we, than we actually believed. So if we have the data and we have the solutions and we have all the commitments, why are emissions still rising? In fact, they went up 1% last year. We don't even have the emissions peak date in sight yet. And we're supposed to reduce by 50% by 2030. So where do all the solutions go? And in which combination? So our thesis is that solutions need to come in suites. The technology, the policy from government, the social and the nature-based, we need them all to work in concert. And this is precisely the focus of the Pi solution recommender. What's the right suite of solutions for every place on the planet? So I'll give you an example of a failed policy solution. The Dutch government is among the most ambitious on their climate plans in the entire world. They plan to do everything the way that it needs to be done. Net zero by 2050, 49% emissions reduction by 2030, and they've targeted all the right sectors, including agriculture, which is where things went terribly wrong. Recently, the farmers uh, in Holland have formed a political party called BBB. It's the Bauer Burger Bevegung, the Farmers Citizen Movement. And they recently took eight out of 12 seats in parliament and caused mayhem dumping manure on highways and city streets, objecting to the restrictions being put on them for climate change, fertilizers and pesticides, which actually is understandable because this impacts their livelihoods. Lower crop yield, more pests, less income. Life is already tough enough as a farmer. So what could have worked? The key is providing the solutions to the people that make up for the loss from the restrictions. So what are these solutions? Another terribly busy slide, but um, it shows you the influence of actors within the ecosystem. This is also from this amazing report, The Paris Effect. So start to the left. Public is beginning to influence government and finance via purchasing, investing, voting, and employment decisions. Government is beginning to influence via R&D commitments to emerging tech. Finance is gaining confidence because government is giving assurances in that emerging tech. So if we grease the wheels a little more, this should all come together. Now, greasing wheels means making decisions easier, giving investments more predictability, understanding the impacts to both people and planet. So let's go back to this very useful database of climate solutions, a thousand location-based solution by country, doesn't cover enough ground, but it's a good start. So excuse me, I asked the machine, can I please have the suite of solutions necessary to get my town of 50,000 people to net zero? Primary income is agriculture, income isn't big enough already. Most are basically broke with a few prospects, including the mayor's office. Guess which town? It could be any town in Spain, in Portugal, in Poland, in Canada, the US, Tunisia, Indonesia, on and on. It's actually my hometown of Sadirac near Bordeaux in France. It's a G7 nation. It's the, lar it's the second largest economy in Europe. Agriculture is a significant part of GDP, 
and people prefer to eat locally sourced. So how do we deploy solutions at speed and scale? We need to figure out where they all need to go based on best practices of solutions working in suites that also satisfy human needs as well as the planets. So the big idea, why don't we put all those solutions together and geomatch them with all the location-based problems complete with predicted impact? Let's measure them against human and planetary needs and let's give these insights to the world, an open access platform for the cities, the local and national governments, even companies, humans generally, and give them the visibility into the specific suite of solutions they need to solve their local problems. How much will it cost? What will be the benefits that they can expect? So the climate PI, the PI stands for planetary intelligence. Once we're a little bit better known, we might just call it PI. So essentially it's a geo-targeted climate solution recommender with the foresight of what deployments look post-investment. Our mission is to identify which are the highest impact suites per need per location, because we need to go so much faster for net zero to become a reality. We need to focus on the 20% investments that have the 80% impact and we need to know where they're gonna work. So this roadmap, providing the what goes where, which benefits to people and planet, you'll realize as an investor, will facilitate citizen, corporate, and government action, is our, is our promise. It'll enable you to see a projected outcome before you take action. It gives confidence in an investment. So I shall now, unshare screen and pull out the pie. Actually, does this work if I just switch over? Very good. Okay, so as you can see, this is looking at the primary health signals of the planet. Human wellness index, ocean heat content, temperature change, CO2 content in the atmosphere, all of these things. And it's all based on the nine planetary boundaries, which most of you are familiar with having been to Terra. And those of you who are not, will go through it a little bit in more detail afterwards. So the way the pie works is you choose a place and we've chosen Egypt because COP was there last year. But in addition, because the city of Luxor, which is not where COP was, COP was in Sharm el Sheikh, which is not a real city. It's a city built on tourism there to serve hotels. But Luxor is a very typical city in Middle East, North Africa. And what we wanted to demonstrate was that all of the solutions to climate change are actually also solutions to the people problems. So you choose your place and you search for problems. And you have a number of them present. And again, these are gonna be similar to many other places. So it's identifying high waste as a significant problem. And so let's find out what the solutions are to high waste. There are a number of them, right? Citizen driven waste collection, plastic waste repurposing, and it gives you the estimated cost. And as Tony likes to say, it's the t-shirt rating system, small, medium, large an estimated time scale, the amounts of deployments that have been tested and viewable. And so let's, let's select a, a number of these that we wanna look at. And then it will recommend to us specific technologies, products that you can use to monitor the efficiency or the functionality of the solution that you're deploying. So we've developed a handful of uh, native applications to be able to use this. And you'll see here, there are a number of different applications, one of which River Smarts is actually originally was used to help in a cleanup project in the Ganges River. And it's an IoT project. And it understands the health of the river through sensors and it predicts uh, outcomes of different cleanup uh, practices. Obviously it's still in the works because that's not yet a clean river. 
And then we have the solution explorer. So the solution explorer is where you get to see what does impact look like? And we're looking at high waste generation, right? Citizens waste. So understanding impact, comparing solutions, deployed three months on average. So I won't go through all these details. And if any of you would like to play with this separately, you know, do, do reach afterwards, reach out afterwards. Now, this is V1. So there are a number of features that are not yet live, but you get the idea. So let's go back to, this is the other native app that we've developed because the big question is, how do you go from macro to micro, right? How do you actually, now I have two of these open. How do you collect the lessons on the ground? How do you monitor what's working? So this is all policy-based, policy, solution, and impact. So you get to choose what your objectives are. I'm gonna just skip this and go right to the actual dashboard. So this can be used by a city, a human in his home, her home, their home. It can be used by a company. It can be used by anybody who wants to understand which solutions are going to work to solve these problems. And everybody, every city, let's use cities as an example. Cities all have their own challenges. They're not all energy, waste, water, biodiversity. They might be, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to, change this to a uh, number of uh, Ukrainian refugees that we were able to integrate into society. That was a city in Germany that wanted that. You can choose the description of what your goals are. And you can also look at the interventions, all the different solutions that might be available for you to start monitoring. And each of these solutions are just, you know, a description of, the different times it's been deployed, maybe a video, some of the benefits, requirements to install, maintenance requirements, just brief information on each. And this is all about setting my goals. So maybe I want to increase renewable energy capacity. Here's what I can expect it to do in terms of impact and benefits. So let's go back to my little town of Sadirak. Live demos are always a challenge yeah. with <laughs> technology. <laughs> so you can see this is an open source database. It enables the uploading of data and, and both solutions and problems, all the above. It's an open source data called database called Cesium. It's a developer platform on geospatial data. It does visualization, it does data pipelines, curated data analytics. So we've been using this to interact with all of the data that's been collected around the world. So I can find my little location. And here we are, that's our little home. And so you'll be able to understand what solutions are available, what problems are located. Slowly going back to the presentation. getting a lot of reaction on chat. People are very uh, amazed at what the climate plan can do. That's great. Thank you so much for the comments. I promise to go as quickly as possible so that we can get to the conversation. Yes. So let's take the sound of uh, SETIRAC and see how we're measuring planetary impact. So this can be done at a micro scale. Here's the planetary scale. But if you set the targets correctly in each place, having their own challenges. So Rural Sadirac, France has soil health problems, 
water health and availability, there's drought, air quality, pollution from transport. As Philip knows, everybody drives in rural France because there's no decent public transport. Biodiversity is a challenge. Those are the planet problems, but as you can imagine, we just can't tell farmers in Sadirac, most of them are vineyards, no more pesticides, no more fertilizers. They barely break even with the tiny margins on an average bottle sold if they sell the full stock. So what you're seeing here is a measurement tool we use to take into account the people needs. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs reimagined for the modern world. So regardless of economic stage of development, global north, global south, everyone has these basic needs. And if you tell them to give up any of them in the name of climate change, the answer is manure on your street. So solution suites have to either stay in line with people's living conditions or better yet, this is the promise of transitioning to our sustainable future, improve the quality of lives. So we found that the best model to use to guide our work was the donut economy. So this is a model, many of you I'm sure know, uh, created by Oxford economist, Kate Rayworth. And as you can see, it beautifully combines the needs of the planet with the needs of humans. So if we can make decisions within the safe space for humanity, the donut economy, then we can live a sustainable life on this planet. If not, we are certainly not going to make the predicted 10 billion by 2050. So this is the guiding model that we'll use in the solution recommendations by suite by location. So Project Drawdown's brilliant work looked at each of these solutions potential impact at global scale. Unfortunately, we need to understand the impact at local and micro scale, Sadirac scale, in order to make decisions to invest in solutions. So this is how the climate pie is approaching this. We started researching and researching and researching. In fact, that's pretty much the majority of our work the past year. We've developed a database of hundreds of solutions, nature, technology, social, and policy, and we've attributed estimated impact at local scale. This will enable us to predict the impact of a recommended suite. So when we say open data, this is part of what we mean. This is the perfect task for crowdsource data, working with individuals, organizations, government, everybody to collect testbed data on how things should work and do work. And as time goes on and the IoT infrastructure matures, it'll get better and better at validating these predictions. And we know that this infrastructure is in the works. So when we say looking at um, impact, we mean emissions reduced or avoided. We mean water efficiencies, human wellness, waste, uh, biodiversity, air quality. And we have been working a lot with the CDP's data. And the CDP is the climate... Uh, disclosure portal. And obviously, the CDP uh, has its flaws, has its um, its strengths, but because it's, uh, it's self-declaration. So it's cities report on their data, companies report on their data. And so this will get better and better with time when, for example, the climate trace data, which is the global stock take, matches the CDP's data, which means that finally the carbon accounting system is working. And we've actually chosen two primary indicators, human wellness and CO2 equivalent emissions, because there are 200 plus sustainability indicators, mobility, walkability, green to gray ratio of an urban environment, which is a really interesting one. But overall, we have to reduce emissions and people have to be happy. And the HDI, the Human uh, Development Index is interesting because it's um, life expectancy, number of average years of education, average income per capita. And it's, it's a bit rough, but it means uh, poverty equals short life expectancy. It's fairly simple. So um, back to the concept of place and remembering that we chose cities of whatever size communities work as well, as our first area of focus. Internally, we call them nanoclimates, not microclimates because that's the physical climate, but nanoclimates. And our aim with the impact measurement data is to understand factors that influence the success or failure of a solution within a suite. 
using emissions and human wellness as our guiding uh, outcomes. And eventually to be able to categorize locations by these factors, as well as the problems the location selected to address. So poverty, drought, et cetera, et cetera. Education, all of the things, income per capita. Uh, we anticipate that we many, many lookalikes that share the same factors and problems, but over time, observation, data, machine learning, and PIES reviewed output will actually tell us the truth. So let's take an example of a lookalike, uh, two lookalike nanoclimates. So are Amsterdam and Copenhagen lookalikes? Are they the same? Are they in the same cluster? So similar political attitudes, similar climate goals, similar populations, population density, income education levels per capita, similar natural resource proximity near the ocean. Everyone likes to ride bikes and eat vegetables. The answer is maybe. So we'll learn many un known unknowns over time that determine the categorization of locations. Things that humans consider completely obvious, but the machine identifies them as important determinants to an outcome of an impact. Ultimately, the goal is to have an exhaustive categorization of locations everywhere on earth and understand which locations are the lookalikes in that cluster because this will allow us to understand the recommended suite of solutions per location. And because we have the projected impact, this is what we mean by map the path to sustainability. So there will be lessons learned and eventually taught by the PI. Now we've been talking to many, many, many cities, many communities, that's pretty much most of what we do when we're not doing research. And we're still in the early stages but we've been having interesting conversations and understanding what kind of lessons we wish for the machine to be able to teach. So an example is Sudbury. Sudbury is a, a Canadian mining town. They would like to do sustainable mining. Now, what is that? Does it exist? They're going to give it a go. They want to attract new residents. They want new companies to move in. They want to improve the health of the population. They want to reach net zero. So the PI is going to benefit from learning what works, why, and why not, so it can share with other mining towns who also want to change. And what about LA? Many don't know it's actually a city built on the oil and gas industry. They have over 6,500 wells that they have to turn off within the next 20 years. And they want to do it a lot faster than that. And all these wells are located in disadvantaged areas. There's health income pollution challenges that need to be overcome. So how do they prioritize those well shutdowns and what happens to the community when they do? Which solutions will help them get to happy people and happy planet? So there are many other cities in many parts of the world that are in similar positions. So, you know, what will work to get them there? Time will tell, but we need to learn from best practices what works, what doesn't, and why. So we have chosen cities as a first area of focus because we always apply the 80-20 filter. What's the 20% you can focus on that will have the 80% impact? And as we mentioned, happy people, happy planet. So if people say yes to solutions, the majority of the world's population live in cities, we will make progress faster. But we know there are brilliant minds focused on land degradation challenges, regenerating, protecting our oceans, preserving and expanding forest cover. With time and broad collaboration, we'll be able to connect with those minds and platforms to gather all the lessons to help collectively teach the art of the possible. So coming quickly to an end, we know we're not alone. The solutions are out there. We just wanna help bring them together in a collective platform that learns to teach the suite of solutions that can heal every place and person on the planet. So our next steps. Our next step is to develop version two of what you saw today, the Pi, and we'll begin to incorporate all of the solutions data that we've been collecting. And then it's time to start using it in real environments to begin learning and teaching lessons. So in order to get there, we need collaborations, and partnerships for data. 
We need sponsors and investors. We need corporate partnerships. And actually, more immediately, and I'm a little overwhelmed by this because this was a phone call that came an hour ago. We've just been invited to participate in a private event uh, with the Dalai Lama. It's a SDGs champion uh, event, and it takes place once a year, and it's normally attended by Christiane Figueres. And we have a month to decide. So what we'd really like is sponsorship in sending our team to introduce us to Christiana Figueres and the Dalai Lama. So with that, I thank you immensely for having the patience to sit through my many, many slides. <laughs> Just enough slides, it was great. <laughs> thank you so much, Jenny Marie. And we're very excited about the upcoming meeting. Um, that would be incredible, Symbios. absolutely. Yes, it would absolutely be awesome. Um, hi again, everyone. I'm Leanne Hickman, and thank you so much for populating the chat. Lots of great questions. Wanted to start first with uh, Alifia's question. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Alifia, she wanted to ask what our typical typical customers would be, or who are typical uh, customers? Such a good question. I'm going to move <laughs> off of this slide because I think it's going to make people uh, crazy with the moving uh, the moving. <laughs> The moving logo. So typical customers for us um, is it's challenging to say because we need to we be working with community with city. So actually, it would most likely be a corporate sponsor who wants to help a city um, reach net zero. So, for example, a BMW sponsors the decarbonization projects in Munich. So I think that's the easiest uh, is a sponsorship by a corporate. But cities can use this as a uh, subscription uh, dashboard to monitor their process. Companies can use it. It actually can be used by anyone. That's the idea, is that we are all a part of the fabric that will get us to net zero. Wonderful, yes, good. And cities as well, like the actual municipal governments, right? Someone was asking about municipal governments and which ones would be most likely to um, sign on. Hey, Jenny Marie, yes, can you hear me on that? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Yeah. The, um, another question came in. Um, how, how, this is from uh, Ms. Pratt. Uh, how do you predict the effectiveness of the interventions within the Pacific location? So you kind of, you kind of uh, highlighted that started with the nano, but if you can give a little bit more detail. So that's, uh, that's, Honestly, that's the, the big question, right? Because we can take from existing deployments, you know, tested solutions. So one of my favorite examples is the, how do you reduce the methane emissions from cows burping? Because that's actually an enormous amount of methane emissions. And the answer is you feed them seaweed. You add seaweed to their, uh, to their, to their feed and it reduces emissions by 90%. Now that's one slash 10 tests and other tests will show 80% and some will show 20%. So it's going to have to be a learn as you go. And that's why we say it's estimated impact and it will get more and more accurate the more it's tested, the more it's shared. So excellent question. The, the actual measurement instruments are not ubiquitously available, but they're going to get better and better and better as IoT devices and sensors and carbon accounting as well becomes much more commonplace and accurate. And accurate, exactly. Um, so Jenny Marie, a question, I guess, uh, attached to that would be, how do we keep the data updated? Um, well, it actually can be updated on a constant basis, but if you think about reasonably speaking, it's not really necessary because if you're measuring it even in a static manner on a quarterly or monthly basis, what you're looking for is progress, up, down, yes, no. So it's not critical that it's real time. And in fact, resource consumption wise, you know, this is an expensive ex operation to run from a resources and emissions perspective until we can figure out net zero uh, data storage, it's not to our advantage to have real time constant flow of data. We will understand if something's working with static updates 
and and really efficient minimal um collection and usage we're not aiming to have the biggest of big data we're aiming to have the right data exactly important and there were some questions about data someone's asking if are we using nasa and so forth so if you can give a little bit more detail of i mean you did list many of them but where the data is coming from and who's sharing with us hey. <laughs> i knew this question was coming and i was sort of hoping that it wouldn't it's the hardest one of all so um, we often get asked this question, and this is not an exhaustive list of what we're looking at to power the pie, but it's a complex question because it implies, are you getting the right and true data on the planet's health signals, local, micro, macro? Um, we're giving it our best go given current resources, but it's, you know, it's an open and evolving process. Wonderfully, the world um, intergovernmental associations and scientific organizations are actively making this publicly available. And we've had wonderful support from the scientific community. Dr. Chip Fletcher, who's a Terra friend, we were thrilled when he said, this is exactly what we need. Use me in any way that you want. And so we're finding that the community is so open and keen to collaborate that data access is not the challenge. Fantastic. And um, Philip Shepard did have a quick question, uh, sort of on the same notion. Philip, did you want to ask your question? Yes, thanks very much. Um, I just wondered how the, you, you talk about the solutions and the, the, the fantastic list you've made and comparing those to, to, to the issues. And I wondered if the solutions update automatically is a function of technological innovation or if that's one of the, the biggest challenges we're facing here. Oh. Philip, thank you for this challenging question. So um, they do not currently update automatically in the system. This is V1 that is absolutely scheduled in the product roadmap, there is no question, but they're not yet. And actually we want to, in some senses, take it reasonably slow so that we have, we can observe, you know, because this is, this is, you know, AI is minds and machines, and it's minds teaching best practices to machines. So this is about subject matter experts looking at the data and saying, yeah, no, that doesn't make sense. I think you dumped your seaweed beside the bucket of the cow's feet. That didn't work. Try again. So it's not something that we need to be constant update. It's actually better if we have observation from a human perspective before from a machine perspective. Hmm. Wonderful, thank you. We do have a raised hand also by Jayesh. Oh, poor Jayesh has been waiting forever. I know, sorry, Jayesh. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, so many people that's perfectly fine. I, I mean, there thank are wonderful you. questions coming and I'm listening. Uh, my question uh, uh, was that, uh, can a sustainability uh, decarbonization consultant make use of your platform? for doing client work, because I think it can be used for corporates, industries, uh, because at the end of the day, all so industries. Much. We would love yeah. it so much, yeah, because- Can you the, sign me up? Please, Leanne, please write <laughs> his name down, get his email, no, we'd love to, because- I, I'll actually, reach out, I'll reach out. Please do, I'll yeah, definitely reach corporate, out. corporate matters a lot, right? Corporate, you can cut the emissions pie in many ways, but right, you can right. cut it, as the majority is corporate and everybody living in cities, when you say 73% of emissions in cities, it's also the businesses that live in cities. So we would love to help and learn and work with organizations who can teach the lessons of how it's being done. There are absolutely amazing champions right now, fantastic examples of corporates actually making the, the hard changes to get there. So we would absolutely love to learn from that. This is not you know, without the need for business lessons as well. Yeah, because I'm doing some work on, on a very narrow based at the moment on energy transition only uh, with, okay. with uh, industries in India. Last year, I did a lot of work there and some uh, on carbon credits and carbon offsets, but in a very, very limited space. That's why I joined Teradu to learn more about everything yeah. else. And I, because I thought the subject was much bigger than those, what I was already doing. So I stepped back and now when I look at it, of course, it's much bigger. And yes. uh, Project Drawdown Gosh. was fantastic in the first yeah. place. Yeah. And that was what was going on in my head as to how do I make, how do I use this such humongous thing? 
uh, how do I bring it to the clients kind of a thing? And there you bring this platform here and it's it's like, wow, it's awesome. It's just wonderful. So yeah, would love to look deeper into this. Uh, you know, I'll reach out. For sure. Thank we you. Have, we have Tara to thank for this platform. Quite honestly, Absolutely. this community is what brought this to life. It took it from a PhD thesis to an right. actual um, product plan. And, right. you know, it's it's evolving every single day. Right. It evolves. And just like you said, the sure. problem, you keep discovering it's it's bigger and then it's bigger and then it's bigger. It's immense. And there's no such thing as a sustainability professional. No offense meant. We're all yeah, learning. Yeah. As understand. We, understand. we are, yeah. right? I mean, nobody knows yeah, what sustainability looks like. Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. economics, it's politics, it's psychology, it's anthropology, it's science, it's climate. It's, there's no such yeah. thing as an expert in all of those fields. Yeah, so yeah. inherently, we must share. Absolutely. Right. It's like digital. You don't, Thank you don't, you. We don't have a digital department anymore. Every job is a sustainability job. Every, yes, true, yes. true, true. Absolutely. Um, we now have a question about remediation. Uh, Paul was asking a question if we've identified any radioactive waste tracking, and we do have a lot of information about this. So I don't know oh. if yourself or Alex can answer that. I don't, I don't know if I actually, I don't know if Alex stayed on the call. So interestingly, Alex is working with a depollution company called Valgo Group. And three years back when we first started this, we looked at soil land as a first potential area of focus and depollution of land because as the oil and gas industry transitions, they're leaving a lot of polluted land behind. So that's as important as any of the other sectors. So that's something we would like to definitely learn about, gather data on, and Valgo is embarking on an incredible new uh, PFAS solution. I don't know if you guys have been following the PFAS contamination issue, the forever chemical that is literally everywhere in everything that we do, all of our bodies contain PFAS. And Valgo has come up with a, an organic solution to remediate water and soil from PFAS. I won't say how it's done because it's crazy interestingly natural and they have a patent pending, but it's just fantastic. This is why nature-based solutions are mind boggling. You know, they are like making plastic out of seaweed, you know, making Anyway, nature is wild. Nature is wild. Um, Vinny Marie, I wanted to turn our attention over to Sasha. Sasha, you have a great question talking about um, social justice. If you wanted to ask that question, if Sasha's still here. I thought she had her hand yes, up. Well. Absolutely. Sorry. You are coming oh, wonderful. Off. Thank you. Not um, to put you in the spot, but. That's yeah, great. No, absolutely. I, so I'm wondering, I know that it's well documented with data-based solutions that any sort of database or framework will have inherent bias baked into it. And so I'm wondering from a climate justice standpoint, when you're working with something that has data as its foundation, there needs to be sort of a concerted effort to mitigate the effects of those assumptions and the biases that are baked into the assumptions that underlie the data. And I'm wondering how you think about that and how you are counteracting those natural effects um, so that the, the platform isn't amplifying some of the um, biases inherent in the data. You are so right. This is absolutely the number one problem with machine learning is if you teach it based on historical practices, it will repeat the mistakes that we've been making until now. So you're so right about that. Um, what we're actually not focused on is necessarily teaching the machine with historical data. We prefer teaching it with um, best practices. You know, um, there are there are very there are an immense amount of amazing things happening. And, you know, Costa Rica is the one net zero place on the planet and they got rid of the military and they reforested. So those are lessons worth teaching. 
but historical lessons where, I mean, the injustices of AI that, you know, for using the justice system in the US perpetuates historical actions or AI used in uh, deciding on human resource choices like choosing CVs. Well, in the past, the best candidates have always looked like this. They perform best in our company. So let's choose that kind of person. And actually, that means that all the other people that don't look like that don't get the chance to prove that they're also great. So I, I agree with you so much. And the answer, I think, is you take a look at your data. You know, you don't actually just feed it into the machine and go, have, have at it. This is truly first minds, then machines. And what we what we aim to teach is the good lessons or you know, allow the machine to figure out some good lessons. And the good lessons mean improved wellness of humans, improved wellness of climate. And these are the two factors that we're looking at. And as you can see, it doesn't matter if you're global north or global south, we are all facing similar problems to different degrees and the divisions are getting, we all know what the world looks like. But we have a chance with our transition to actually recreate the world. And that's the promise of these solutions. Wonderful, thank you, Sasha. And um, Manj, do you have a question? Your hand's been up for a while, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. Yeah, Janie, this is like amazing. This is what you guys are doing here. It's like, you know, bringing all the data together and bringing everybody together to actually do something. This is awesome. Um, my question to you guys uh, is like this. So you're going to be working with the, the organizations that are going to be like funding. So the, you know, these, these projects or whatever. And then, and then of course you've got the doers that are going to be like doing these, implementing these projects. Would you be like, sharing uh, the data and the source code with them to evolve that code and data together? So thank you for that excellent um, technical question. In the roadmap, we'd like to not only be open data, we'd also like to be open source because that allows for the community to continue to improve. So, I mean, what we're proposing here, you obviously understand, is a huge build and it's a long product roadmap. So we're truly at the beginning of that long roadmap. And in an ideal world, this is the solutions database that everybody contributes to. And we all get to look and say, mm, no, no, I'm sorry, that doesn't, that, that doesn't make sense. So there are many, um, there's a lot of mitigation that will have to happen over time. Like, eyeballs need to check things and we need to validate. So we have a lot of distance to go. It's funny, uh, most of the technical founders from the team come from cybersecurity, which is amusing, right? That they're all like cybersecurity guys. Tony, our CTO is first a geologist, then a cybersecurity guy. And now he's finishing his PhD on agent-based modeling, which makes a lot of sense for this project, right? Because is the agent the bird in the flock of the birds? Is the agent the tree in the forest? Is it the forest in all the forests in the world? So it's really interesting to, to have that sort of, that perspective in, in building this. Yeah, I guess I think like taking a decentralized view is the way to go, right? When it comes Correct. to these type Correct. of solutions. Yeah. And it creates trust. Right. So there's no single entity owning it. So I think I think it'd be really cool. And that would also give you from a business development perspective, let's say, to engage corporations to actually take part of it. And maybe maybe you're going to be looking at it from a carbon offsetting perspective and saying, hey, look, Microsoft, yes. you want to be part of this. We we could we could offset all these credits for you. I know offsetting is not the favorite terms well, in terms of. I'm it's worth hey. discussing though. It's worth discussing. Yeah. So, you know, we can Absolutely. obviously see the pluses and the minuses and, and obviously Vera is being forced to relook at their process. But if you take the carbon budget, right, what do we have like uh, 260 gigatons left until we hit the limit before we're going to go over 1.5. There is some value in actually doing the math and not just selling willy nilly carbon credits. There is actually a finite number of credits. 
So why are they priced at the moment? The voluntary markets, I think yesterday, was like $3. Why aren't they priced at a gazillion dollars? Because we only have a few left. So we've been toying with the idea of using carbon credits as a means to fund these projects on the ground. So the example I gave of BMW sponsors the electric bus fleet in Munich, and it goes to their scope three emissions because scope three are inherently difficult to A, calculate, B, control, C, mitigate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Through no fault of the business, it's just a complex global challenge that we're all facing. So we're not specifically against carbon credits. We think it might be a tool to be used to preserve biodiversity, but within the you know reasonable math that we have a budget. You know, and we're going to hit it within six to seven years because we're emitting 50 gigatons a year now. So, but I think the global stock take will actually really um, do a lot to shake shake this out. You know, we've probably got two to three years on, or, you know, since 2020, I think the world at large has woken up. I don't know. It's... I woke up in 2019. <laughs> we all had right. our wake up moment, right? Right. I love it. I love it how you 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 have this open mind, open mind, you know, aspect of it. Like it's 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 really good. I I think yeah. it's amazing. Thank you. We just want to get to our last question here from Sora. Sora, can you follow up with us, by the way? I think yes. you know yes. a lot of things, 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 things that we'd like to learn to learn. Absolutely, absolutely, would love to. I mean, I, I know Leanne now, so it's, it's yeah. awesome. Yeah, love we'll to do for sure. Chatting with you. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so Rob, you had a question? Yes, I put it in the chat. Uh, um, so I was just wondering, uh, it's a bit uh, broad, but I was just using one example with carbon capture. So, um, you know, I, I've read that carbon capture, for example, uh, in terms of its efficiency, will need to be scaled at a level that will need to surpass all the current fossil fuel apparatus combined. Uh, so how does, like, how do you, or maybe not you, but how does the software data solution recommend something like that, knowing uh, that it would need to be scaled uh, at a huge level and then be that uh, the financial cost would have to be immense and then see if it's scaled at such a huge level that involves obviously you know a ridiculous amount of actors not just one like local munip uh, municipality um so i don't know but that, that's just using yeah. one example you have other so ones i think you'll find we won't see a lot of recommending carbon capture i think there are some industries that are just going to aggressively do it on their own and there's no need for them to ask the machine what do we do so I think carbon capture is probably one of them. There's a fantastic um, drawdown video that came out in December and it's uh, the recent, you know, the, the roadmap and it details exactly what it's gonna look like, you know, and the carbon capture piece, if we all do our jobs and do a good job and wake up and, you know, participate and say yes to the right solutions, it, it should look like maybe 5% of the entire, you know, emissions drawdown necessity but there's so many there's so many unknowns you know my husband has a habit of saying yeah but what happens when the permafrost melts right. and the thing comes out then it's game over and I'm like it's good to live with a pragmatic engineer when you're a <laughs> ever optimist who thinks there's answers and solutions for everything and that people are wonderful he brings me down to the ground and reminds me this is so very serious. Right. Okay. You know, this is extinction level. We might not make it to 10 billion story. Right. But, right. but I guess putting carbon capture aside, because I was just using that as one example. In general, I guess what I'm hearing is uh the software would not recommend a tool uh that is you know going to have it a take a lot of skill. Uh, and B, with it that it would foresee only as one to five percent of the solution. So, like aerosols at scale, probably is not something it would recommend. I think we're going to wait 
uh, I think you know it would be prudent to wait to to watch the um, the maturity of these solutions, right? So you'll notice there's no discussion of geoengineering and there's no discussion of carbon capture in here, except perhaps you know carbon capture at source. Um, and I think that um, you know the the Iceland project, what are they called? Uh, Climeworks. That's the only existing example, and I think it cost them like an enorm way too much. Like the economics just don't work out yet. So that's not a that's not a scalable solution yet. Um, and it's so we really like the Solar Impulse Foundation because they validate is this working now, you know, and is it financially viable? Because that's the other challenge. Is there's so many wonderful startups. And they're coming up with these fantastic solutions, but if they can't follow through on an order, then unfortunately it didn't work. So it, you know, the, the solution has to actually work to be able to be reasonably recommended. So there's a lot of this, um, we just have to be humans and, and understand our, our own you know, flawed natures. And we have to be practical and reasonable about, about recommendation. This is why, it's minds before machines. Very true, good way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also had one question from a, a Terra, someone who's taking Terra right now and is in the throes of it. Um, and we should say that everybody uh, at the Climate Pie goes through Terra. Um, we, we're all very much on the same page and have the same sense of urgency, which is fantastic. Um, but they, they're asking, uh, Jenny Marie, how can they help? How can they get involved? How can Terra graduate fellows get? Oh, we'd love to. Kind of so, I mean, we are as eager for you as you might be to work with. I mean, the, the level of ambition is beyond reasonable. You know, I I sometimes wonder, do I sound like a crazy person when I'm if someone in my town asks me what I what I do? I'm like, uh, uh, how do I answer this to not sound like I'm bananas? Um, <laughs> so we would love we would love help. We would we are interested in development, data science, marketing, social media, operations, it, all of it. Um, we are not adequately funded to, to fill all the positions that we need right now, but please come to us and we'll discuss because the one currency we always have is the experience of working with these solutions. And we're, we're so excited that we're starting to get a little recognition we were nominated for this incredible prize which there were 365 uh, nominations last year to the Gulbenkian prize and Greta Thunberg and the IPCC and the global covenant of mayors are the previous winners so we don't really we're think like that <laughs> we're necessarily gonna but if Johan Rockström you know of the nine planetary boundaries just noticed what we were doing, that would be more than worth it. So we're, you know, we're literally, we're 18 months, two years into this and we'll be incredibly thrilled if two years from now, anybody can go on and hit, show me what I need in my area. Or I wanna look at my area and I wanna teach you what our area is doing or any version of the above. Or I'd like to develop something that will help your system learn what's going on here. You know, all of these solutions, like the Ganges, um, it's called River Smarts. Uh, if the, we need to connect with the Ganges project, which is from a, a former company called Alchemy AI, we need to connect with that system so that we're learning the lessons of, and, and how do you prioritize the solutions in a, in a, in a polluted river? Because it's the waste management, it's the chemical loads from the factories, it's the, you know, it's a long list. It's not a technology problem. You don't need AI to figure out what's going on there, which is the same as all the polluted rivers, which as we saw, 86% of our rivers are polluted. Not a nice way to end this 
Leanne, say something optimistic. Uh, we have <laughs> put in our, uh, our email addresses as well as our LinkedIn, and we're going to be sure to follow up with anyone who would like to do that. This will have to look at wrapping up the formal uh, Terra session that we're on now, but Jenny Marie did uh, mention that she has a few more minutes, maybe about another 10 minutes, if anyone would like to stay on and ask some questions directly. But thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for being involved in climate, for thank looking you. at this transition. Chin Wu, thank you yes. everybody for joining. Thank you so much for your support. This is really, it means a lot to us. Yes, it does very much so. Very much so. You're Thanks, Chin sharing. Wu. Still Great. Sharing. Thank you. Yes, you thank you all. Share now if, we can, if anyone just has a question, if they want to jump in, we have another 10 minutes. And you can see all the gazillion slides that uh, we didn't show. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> People are asking for the slides, though, Jenny. We'll have to prepare that then to- um... How on earth will I be able to share 63 slides? <laughs> yes, we will give those no to problem. Tara to share. Exactly. No Craig, no you've got a question. Yes, it's been a profile. I, I, I do, among others. This is this is really amazing. Thank you both. And it, it relates to what I was uh, just writing about in my first assignment in my fellowship, which was we've got all these tech, tech we've got the technology where we've said that we've kind of known it. We're just now coming to the point where, yeah, we have all the data coming in. And I think just the last couple of years with it kind of advances in data collection and, and systems and all that. But it's so disjointed. It's so fragmented. It's all over the place. How we have possibly put it together in a way that's meaningful and, and you're you're doing that. It's pretty amazing. Um, I've got a variety of questions, but I think one, uh, I'll, I'll stick to two. Um, and and maybe that's that's cheating and taking up too much time. I'll, I'll <laughs> okay, take another one. It. My, my, <laughs> my, my question is another piece I've been thinking about is, you know, ultimately, like you said, at some point, like you have to relate the solutions and the impact to dollars. And some sectors we know are still way harder, aka way more expensive to abate, like say uh, cement um, or steel making. Um, so is is that something that is kind of in, inherent in some of the solution finding or or another thing to bring in at some point, how you'd relate kind of the 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 dollar feasibility of current solutions uh, or technologies or solutions and relating that back to uh, suggestions? Mm. <laughs> Perhaps you have the answer to your question. <laughs> it's such a tough one, right? So um, because the affordability of these solutions is, is not always there. You know, the example of, so I, I have one slide that I was told I must get rid of because it was too long. I hope I still have it. Um, there's some amazing things happening and they sound big, but they're actually small. So if you think about the, it was the India renewable auction. I don't know if anybody in India remembers this or heard about this. So they auctioned off, um, an enormous amount of capacity and you had to cover 80% of night and day hours in order to win. And it was a combination of solar and wind and storage that won. You look like you you know about this, Paresh. Yeah, I'm based out of India, so <clears throat> that happened quite lately, yes. Yeah. So that had to be expensive, right? The auction. And also they're they're paying to train six million smallholder farms to do regenerative agriculture. So there's got to be a period between the, and I start the process and I realize the results that they've got to be funding. So these are not cheap solutions. Spain just um, decided to pay for the retirement of all coal workers, 48 and above. That's not cheap, but these are, you know, the solutions are very expensive. Um, but at the small, you know, at the city and community level, like a green roof, that's not that expensive. City farms, and that's not that expensive. So, I mean, it's going to be exponential and incremental. And I think we're sort of focused primarily at the people level before the broad industry level. Because I think the cement industry, they definitely know that innovation is happening and they're going to have to move to because they made they, they made commitments you know they made commitments in 
Um, I haven't got the slide with the actual when they can make commitments, but they've all made commitments. Same goes for steel. They've made commitments. Aviation, they've made commitments. So there's, you know, industry commitments at the industry body uh, or association that have been made. And so I think they will have so much influence on the shift. So there'll be areas that shift automatically and the momentum's already started and we don't need to influence that i think this is all about influencing the we don't understand how to get this place to transition you know this city this community this country you know with all the messy in-betweens so there's going to be some sort of simple direct wins shipping aviation you know steel cement thank goodness renewable energy although i don't know if adam is still on the call but renewable energy at the community level is not that simple. It's, uh, you know, the grids are not ready. The distribution is not ready. I don't know enough about energy distribution and, you know, all the pieces of the puzzle that need to go there. So I'm sure someone on the call does if they would like to step in. Julie, you're nodding your head. And you're on <laughs> mute. I, I, have, I have a husband who's an energy lawyer. <laughs> so. He's upstairs and he would say more, but simply uh, the transmission uh, issue is is just enormous. Uh, and I think we've all learned about that in Terra and I would put that near the top. Yeah, the fragmentation is uh, is where we, that's the niche where we wanna sort of place ourselves is how to, how to bring the pieces together in the fragmented suites of solutions that need to happen if that's energy or if that's agriculture is it Rotem? Rotem? How do I say your name? It's Rotem, yes. Rotem. <laughs> Hi. Um, I am, so this is the first time I'm hearing about the platform, and it is so awesome. And the scale of the different data sources that come together is just amazing. And I'm trying to just to make sense of it and break it down into like small chunks of success. And I'm just wondering, how, do, how are you going to know sooner rather than later that you are successful that you are bringing a change i will try to guess <laughs> and then you can tell me if i'm right and to, uh, excited to hear your answer so i would guess that th the way that you presented this platform is people maybe in the municipality or or, or you know government levels they want to make a change they want to implement some technology they want to invest in something but they don't know what because there are so many solutions. I'm just wondering, how are you going to know that your platform is, 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 um, is successful? Is someone, you just see an uptick in the like, you know, number of municipalities or organizations that are choosing to invest in something rather than in nothing. Um, and I'm wondering if, uh, like, in addition, if this, if the system can like, push people who do not want to make this change. So I live in Texas, um, you know, people who are not, who are suffering from external pressure to not invest in these kind of technologies and kind of smooth that out. Ah, uh, such a tricky question. Actually, you asked many questions in one. So uh, I'll start <laughs> with the, um, how do you get to, um, no. I think my answer was, prioritization of lessons we teach the machine. So we want to first and foremost access the big super wins, you know, like, wow, Oslo, you managed to do 100% zero emissions development, you know, like construction sites, sound free. That's crazy, right? That's wild, that's beyond most of our imagination. And yet they're doing it. I lived in Oslo for 10 years and it was, Norway is the most technologically advanced place possible. Like you can go online and you can see anybody's income, where they live, everything. Everything's open. There are only four or five million people, granted. But it's super modern and it's manageable in that way and everybody wants to see change. So there are some really awesome lessons that we want to learn first. And then there's also some amazing associations who are gathering the lessons in their various areas of practice. So there is an association doing best practices in policy. 
and we want to learn everything that they have to say. You know, the um, Minister for the Future uh, Generations in New Zealand, brilliant. You know, no more roads in New Zealand, fantastic. Uh, was it Massachusetts that uh, elected a an elected oh official who's in charge of the future generation, something. In any case, there are so many interesting policy moves mm -hmm. that are worth recording. So I think what we wanna do before we start learning the actual truth on the ground, we wanna learn the best practices and start figuring out where do they belong. So I was very pleased that nobody noticed that we didn't talk a lot about geomatching. <laughs> because that's really, really tricky. Yeah. So yeah. you take the olivine rock weathering solution, right? Volcanic rock, fantastic solution. You stick a big rock on the beach, the waves crash over, ton for ton CO2, it goes away. Magic, right? And it's available in so many different countries. Mm -hmm. And wait a second, I'm in France, right? So does the southwest of France, Bordeaux, do they say yes to the rocks on the beach? Mm -hmm. Probably very, very net zero over here. And the East, Côte d'Azur, where it's the yachts of the yachts of the money of the money, do they say yes? Mm, I doubt it. No, our beach is worth too much. So can we diagnose and say all the rocks around all the beaches? No, that's when the social factor comes in. Like we saw, you know, the UK fighting wind turbines because they're ugly. So right. these are the barriers that we want to understand who says yes and why, because let's find all those other places. So I think, and, and you also said, when you? Will we... please do, yeah. Yeah, and Rock, and the other thing too is that, you know, we've talked to, we talked to many cities, I talk to many cities all the time, and I can say for a fact, even in, in Texas, they are planning. They are planning for disaster relief. Every city has a disaster relief department they know it's coming, even if that's not what they're saying. So uh, just to give you some solace, I mean, there's more wind investment in Texas than anywhere else in the US. That's right. Yeah, yeah I, did, I didn't mean to, to poo poo where I live. I just no, you, know you that there is all you, a lot we're of all external pressure. <laughs> there is a lot of external pushback, external pushback that, that people that in charge, people might, charge. Uh, yeah. might experience when they try to do something for the good of everyone, including systems. It's tough. I understand God, that it's news, on board. The Tucker Carlson did a 13 minute segment saying, no, climate science is a hoax. No, there are earth haters. How is that possible? Anyway, it, we don't worry about the politics of it's not useful. It'll all, they'll all figure it out. And Leanne made a really interesting point there is that actually it matters what you call it. Because yes, climate change can be a really dirty word for some, but nature preservation is okay. Yes. You know, or risk mitigation, that's okay. So there was a the study in the UK. Changing. Pardon me, Lynn? The language is always changing, but yes. Indeed, indeed. There was a study by the Conservative Party in the UK, or no, it was a study about the Conservative Party to understand what were the words related to climate change that were possible to use in the, let's say, right, you know, Republican sort of mind. And it was conservation, you know, nature conservation is something that's great, they're happy for. Future generations, risk protection. Um, so we may have to change our language, this is possible. And um, Paresh? Yeah, hi. Uh, Jenny and Lian, uh, you know, seems like a promising solution. I missed out on the, the demo side because I was on another session. Uh, but a quick question, a couple of questions over here, uh, and I'll shoot them right away. Uh, number one, when you talk about this kind of platform, is it anywhere close or similar to what Open Earth Foundation is also doing, which is built for non-state actors? We love Open Earth. <laughs> Because these guys oh. are on the I also recently discovered it. I found it extremely unique and interesting. And this yeah. one right in front of me is extremely unique and interesting. I'm just trying to see if there is a similarity between both or you guys both operate on different nodes and you know ends. That's number one. Number two, when you're building this solution and you said that you're open to you know 
work with people and you you talked about ganga you call it ganges it's actually ganga ganga But, yes nama ganga yeah. nama ganga so uh, when you talk about uh, and you also talked about other projects in india so are you actively looking or working on any of the projects in uh, india and how do you kind of you know commercialize it is going to be very vague because i don't do know much about the platform but basis whatever i have been able to collect till now and what i see in front on the in front of me on the screen i thought probably you know these are two quick questions that i want to ask you okay so the first one is the open earth question yes that's and right. i'm very happy you brought them up because they have so two years ago when we started to like map out product road map and architecture and how we're going to do this and our cto was like No, Chai Marie, you do understand how complex this is. <laughs> He says this to me again and again and again. And there were so many pieces of this puzzle that we just sort of pretended that we would get to one day. And it was the the infrastructure, you know, like a oh. new layer in the set in stack, right? It's the it's the web 3.0, it's the sensor, it's the physical understanding of our world. That's a new that's the earth internet. Yeah. And so we discovered Open Earth and what they're doing and the relationships that they have with the UN and they are forging this path. You know, they are are the support and the guide for the UN, for COP, for everybody to say this is how we're going to do it and we're going to work with you. So we're so thrilled that they have done what they've done because they've made it possible for the rest of us to just sort of like slide in our little solution. you know so we'd like to just slide in our little part of the our little piece of the puzzle cuz right. it's too much there's no way one organization could do it it has to be a coalition that grows yes. and grows and grows yes. and maybe inshallah terra will bring everything together maybe right. this will be the climate community but i think open earth is is forging the path to the data to the infrastructure to the you know digitization of the UN and the structures and the because they they needed help you know they put out an RFP a year ago which we really wanted to respond to and they were like we're not up to it <laughs> we can this never is, do this this is what i understand with whatever right. literature is publicly available on their website or you know the the digs report that they have posted uh i see positioning themselves as more as a parallel accountability slash accounting platform to right. what the un or you know bodies like that are doing because un works and operates at a country level like india as a nation state us as a nation state uk as a nation state but my understanding of open earth is hey you know this is country at the top but can i go region can i go city and in the city can i go to a non state actor which is probably let's say i don't know american express or uh, costco or whatever it is in, in in the us and you know what are their emissions and what are they doing yeah. it goes at a very granular level and oh, un is probably 5000 or 10000 feet up so my Indeed. question was was more to when you are talking about the platform that you're building are you you know in parallel with the open earth foundation building for the non state actors who may not directly report to un uh or are you so they all you know? report they all kind of make it into the same system right and it's just the beginning of the carbon accounting and it's very messy and most companies don't know how to do it they certainly don't know how to do scope 3 countries don't even know how to do it humans True. don't even know how to do it True. so the global stock take with um climate trace is going to be fantastic to start the process of fine tuning the accounting and open earth there's a podcast on mcj collective yeah 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 with the founder right yeah. so he yeah, talks about happens. this carbon budget yes and so i think with with you know the way they are approaching the challenge i think that they will be our champions to help that accounting system the carbon accounting work out with nature with the web3 we th- we're super happy that they're doing the work they're doing super happy you know we'll we we'll, we'll just tag in because right. there will be standards that emerge right you right. know there are slowly but surely standards like the WCCD the World Council on City Data yeah, this yeah, Toronto yeah. University of Toronto they do ISO certification for 
sustainable city, smart city, resilient city, yeah. uh, SDG respecting city, which I would love to have all their data because, but it's the city's data, right? So you have to ask each city, but I think we're going to see all this eventually bubbles up into a core where the accountability is and transparency is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is awesome, Jenny. Uh, would it be possible for us to connect at a later date? Of day? course, it'd be wonderful. I, everybody, everybody reach out. We, I wish I could stay all evening and chat with you, but <laughs> I'm sure that my children are waiting for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> we want to keep you away from dinner. So thank you for the information and thank you for the presentation. By the oh, way, this was from my side. If you can yeah. get access to the presentation, the slides sure. that you have, that would be really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. And Tara recorded this, which I'm very happy. So you can see the demo on, oh. uh, on the recording. The demo is not on the deck. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Nice oh, to meet Thank you for your questions. Julie, oh, you have had your hand up forever. Did you have a question yes. before I run away and go cook? <laughs> well, that's very kind. Um, qualitative data, being anthropologically minded, uh, sometimes is um, essential when you don't have the money or it's not reasonable to get quantitative data. And this may fall mostly in the impacts area, uh, whether it's um, there's surveys and qualitative fields or whether there's coding from participant observation or um, longitudinal um, interviewing and all, and that can get coded. So it's a bit like quantitative or there's rich description. Um, can that be fed into the system? Can you please call us next week and show us some of that data so that we can discuss it? Because we've always known, you know, in any organization, there's a list of the really hard things that you haven't figured out. That's one of them. How do you measure human wellness? You know, the, the yeah. hours that we've spent debating mm -hmm. and, and thinking, you know, everybody has their own definition. And so we settled on human uh, HHD, human development index because it's globally recognized, but it's not really good enough, although it's getting good enough with um, the way that the economies have been going. And anyway, but yes, I think anthropology is gonna see its super duper heyday in the coming decades, because we really need to better understand the human condition. Mm -hmm. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a real thing. Self-actualization, mm -hmm. It's true. It actually makes you really, really happy. And that's feeling useful. And mm -hmm. we're the only species on the planet without 100% employment. Mm -hmm. Right? Every other species, they all have jobs. Everyone has a purpose, not humans. So that's anyway. funny. There's so yeah, I can, what I can do is I can send you more reflections on this. I don't sort of have my pa pause on sort of um indices of of wellness although i'll think about it and if i find some i'll send them yeah we'd love to we'd love to have the advice and the counsel and the and the thinking that'd be really interesting thank you cool all right thank you all so much everyone and jenny marie i should tell you too we actually have a, um, a meeting next wednesday with open earth uh, we're oh, meeting good. their partnership uh, directly. good 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 we are Good. making we are making strides and um, you know collecting partners as we go along for sure and key strategic ones at that. Thank you all so much. We still have thirty seven of you here, which is incredible, and we're super um, pleased about that. But uh, we have put our email, our LinkedIn. Um, please check out our website as well as um, the, the mission video that I put on there. It's a short three minute video uh, for all of your enjoyment. And uh, you know, please notice it's out. last year's. It's from last year because we say we have eight years left. Yes, that's the only issue that we have to redo that. Part. <laughs> yes, there aren't nearly enough years left. So thank you all for being a part of it. Thank, Thanks thank too you. Much. Thank you, Chin Wu. Thank you all so much for joining.